Hey everybody, welcome to yet another Journal Club brought to you by uh, LEAF, Life, uh, Life Extension Advocacy Foundation and Lifespan.io. I'm Dr. Oliver Medvedic coming to you from New York City, um, my wonderful living room. So we have yet another Journal Club uh, ready for everybody here um, on the topic of longevity. Um, uh, we have a we have somebody visiting us from Vitadao. Stefano, welcome. Um, join the roundtable here discussion. I don't know if you managed to read the paper. It's a pretty big one, but um, you know we'll try to get through it as much as possible. Um, it's a little early to, to have our journal club. I know this uh, because it's here in the states. It's Turkey Day, Thanksgiving. So um, we're trying to get this um, get this out of the way before everybody can go celebrate with their families. And just as a reminder for next month. December, um, we're going to be having a little earlier too before the before the holidays, the Christmas vacation and whatnot. So I think we're going to have it on December 14th, if I'm not mistaken, probably that that week, that that Tuesday. So it's it's going to be a, another early journal club. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, so without much further ado, um, I'm going to just kind of mention the journal article that we're going to be taking a look at. So let me share my screen here. Uh, so this is my presentation from my PowerPoint. Um, a little out of date. Okay, so uh, the paper here, well, let me actually, the paper here is uh, by Bhattacharya et al. Um, from, I believe, Mass General Hospital. And let me just um, get the title here because I did this a little out of order because I started to just give a little introduction on some of the materials that we that we have. Uh, let's see, where's the, where's the stop sharing? Here it is. Okay. So let me share my screen here to get the paper. Here we go. So the paper title itself is, scroll, 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 axonal generation of amyloid beta from palmitolated APP in mitochondrial uh, mitochondria associated endoplasmic reticulum membranes. <laughs> so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I'm a biologist, so before I read this paper, I was like, uh, what's a mitochondria-associated endoplasmic particular membrane, right? So uh, I know what a mitochondria is. I, I, know what the, I know what the words mean, the independent words, but together, what is that, right? So the acronym is MAMS, Mitochondrial Associated Endoplasmic Reticulum Membranes. And if you recall from uh, biology, um, eukaryotes have a lot of membranes, right? So these things are packed and packed full of all sorts of membranes, plasma membranes, mitochondrial membranes, nuclear membranes, ER membranes, Golgi membranes, vacuoles, lysosomes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So these membranes all, um, you know, compartmentalize different things. Um, so this paper here basically tracks, um, so one thing to mention is that uh, one of the, one of the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the final author on this paper, Rudolf Tanzi, um, the lab where this work is done, um, I believe uh, his, uh, his work back in the 80s um, discovered one of the early genes that was uh, responsible for um, uh, the development of Alzheimer's disease. So that's a you know, claim to fame um, from the Tanzi lab. And this paper here basically um, kind of looks all the way at the other end of the spectrum from the gene to actually where uh, the activity is taking place. And the question that they're answering here is basically how do these amyloid beta plaques actually get out of axons, right? Because, um, so this is Bhattacharya et al. So I'm gonna just kind of stop sharing here. So um, just as you recall, um, we've done some papers on Alzheimer's in the past. Alzheimer's disease is a progressive chronic um, illness that's um, uh, driven by age, aging, and some other genetic factors as well. Um, so all of the different causes, um, it's not quite clear, you know, what all the triggers are. And even the model itself for how Alzheimer's basically progresses as an illness is, is a little debatable. Um, but one of the working models certainly out there is the basically, um, is the accumulation of amyloid beta plaques, these uh, proteins that basically form aggregates and um, lead to neurotoxicity and then lead to further um, memory decline issues um, lead to brain atrophy, so on and so forth. And this is a progressive terminal illness, unfortunately. Um, and there's a lot of other there's a lot of other things that potentially could underlie it. But uh, you know, for better or worse, pharmaceutical companies has been have been looking at um, amyloid beta plaques and the aggregation of these proteins um, in the brain for a long time as as a potential therapeutic target. 
Um, but the question really is, is that, you know, how do these things actually get out? So um, they are associated with axons. So what is, what is the mechanism for, for, for getting, getting this out? And um, uh, we'll take a look at some of the data that's in this paper. Um, and I, I don't think it's quite clear exactly how they're, how they're getting out, but they do implicate these mitochondrial associated ER membranes and some of the, and some of the other um, uh, things that um, are associated with them. So, okay, um, well, what is a mitochondrial associated ER membrane? Good question. Um, let's go to our screen share. So, whoops. All right, so I'm gonna skip a little out of frame for these slides here. Um, so this is from the Bhattacharya et al paper. And this is a figure from their paper, which basically, um, posits their model. So this green thing here, usually I see them drawn in red for some reason, but here's your mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, right? And uh, it's associated with, um, if you do cross sections of a cell, um, basically things are really juxtaposed very closely to, to, uh, to one another. And mitochondria get around a lot. Mitochondria are found in the cell body and also in the axons. And they're found kind of really um, closely up against um, these ER membranes. And um, I'm not exactly 100% sure um, what, <laughs> what mitochondrial associated ER membranes are, but they appear to be some sort of a membrane structure that basically juxtaposes between mitochondria and the ER. Um, and this juxtaposition uh, basically, in these mitochondrial associated ER membrane, um, I guess you can call them vesicles or these regions, uh, they have a co localization of uh, amyloid precursor protein, um, APP, but specifically a variant called PAL APP, so palmitylated APP. Um, and they're concentrated there um, versus being concentrated elsewhere, being concentrated in the rest of the ER or, or somewhere else. Um, and this juxtaposition, um, if you have a lot of them in these MAMs, um, and they're associated with this receptor called S1R and associated with a bunch of other things, um, this is, uh, uh, you know, this palmitylation, which I'll get to in a moment what that is, um, it's a modification, a post-translational modification of a protein. This basically, um, this basically leads to, um, you know, uh, the cell surface localization of these palmitylated APPs, and also then um, processing by various enzymes that are located in the membranes, um, uh, these secretase enzymes, which basically um, cleave it. And part of this APP protein is what causes amyloid beta plaques, and that's released, right? So, so this, is, this is the mechanism. So if you have MAMS or MAMs, <laughs> mitochondrial associated ER membrane um, membranes um, upregulated. You have a lot of them, and you have more of this, more of the aggregation or sequestration, I should say, of palmitylated APP. Um, you get more of it positioned to the plasma membrane, and more of it gets processed. And then that processed byproduct is the amyloid beta, which gets released. And if you downregulate these MAMs, uh, then they don't have a gateway to this palmitylated palmitylated. Um, APP doesn't have a gateway, so to speak, to to sort of get out and um, and uh, get out there and do its thing. So okay, so what is palmitoylation? Um, so proteins um, can be stuck in membranes in a number of different ways. So here's a you know these are all images lifted throughout the internet that have been put on here. So, you know, so you can see what's going on. This is just uh, a random protein and chiron. And this little um, thing with these little uh, ping pong balls is the palmitylation tail. And this is a way for this protein to embed itself into the lipid bilayer, the cross section of the membrane. So inside it's very greasy. So you have a lot of fatty acid tails here, uh, and then you have charged groups on the outside. So um, proteins can be stuck in membranes many different ways. So this is, um, you know, classic textbook image, and I'll get into what this lipid raft thing is in a moment. But if you do a cross section of all these phospholipids, um, you can see that proteins can get embedded through the membrane, through these transmembrane domains, um, all sorts of different ways. This is, you know, GPI anchored protein. But another way is to have this little 
uh, palmitoyl um, tails, this, um, this fatty acid tail, um, get basically attached to a sulfur group on a cysteine residue, which is an amino acid. And this little tail will basically cause this protein to sort of lock into place and float around in the lipid bilayer. So that's a way to basically target proteins. And one of the proteins that evidently gets targeted this way or modified this way is amyloid precursor protein. One thing to mention is um, in these MAMs that they speak of, <clears throat> there are these regions which um, tend to concentrate uh, proteins in. So not only are there MAMs, which is a specialized, I guess, um, membrane structure that's juxtaposed between ER and mitochondria, but even within the membranes themselves, there's specialized regions. And some of these specialized regions go by the name of lipid rafts, right? So um, what that means is that you have lots of proteins concentrated in an area, a patch, if you will, of, of, the, of the membrane itself. Um, and lipid rafts tend to basically um, tend to have very specialized phospholipids. Um, I believe they have sphingosine tails. Um, they're a little bit thicker, as you can see in this image. So the proteins tend to be slightly different. So you, you basically have different subsets of proteins kind of clustered in these lipid rafts. And uh, the clustering in this case happens to prefer palmitylated uh, proteins, particularly APP. So, um, so getting to our APP, so um, basically this is another image I found. So um, the processing that leads to this amyloid beta plaque release happens in lipid rafts and particularly the authors posit in these MAMs. Um, and the reason that this happens is because you have, um, you have in these lipid rafts, the right secretases, the right enzymes that cleave this APP, um, starting, with, um, uh, starting with a beta secretase. This is one example of one called base. Uh, which cleaves off a region of this APP, um, and then a gamma secretase, which cleaves off this other region, which basically is the soluble version of, of this protein, amyloid beta, which then leaves and becomes an aggregate, right? So if this, if this APP is in other areas, this, this processing doesn't occur such that it leads to amyloid beta aggregation, but if it happens in these lipid raft areas, um, that's what happens. And the targeting to these lipid raft areas, uh, particularly within these MAMs, um, is due to this palmitylation. So if you have this non-palmitylated APP, um, you have less of this amyloid beta because it's not in the right area. But once it becomes palmitylated and has this tail attached to it, um, it can basically then float into these lipid raft regions, um, which are located in MAMs. And you have more of this processing taking place in that area, that's, um, and that leads to more uh, amyloid beta. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing here. Oof, so that was that's a lot of stuff happening. Um, and so the authors present data that you know that supports this model. So we'll we'll take a look. So is there any comments from that? Uh, word salad dump that hopefully that flowed in, in, in some logical, coherent way. Word salad. Uh, so far, Oliver, I think you must have either A, been extremely thorough and answered all their questions, or B, they don't know what you're talking about. I probably both. I'm gonna I'm gonna probably say maybe a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B, but mostly column A. So well done. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm not. I'm not. I'm not an expert on on mitochondrial associated ER membranes. Um, Who is? Uh, the authors of the paper. Um, well, but uh, yeah. But but um. Uh, but so I'm. I'm not. I'm not. I'm still not 100 percent certain certain about their their the positioning of these MAMs, whether or not how how much of a part of the ER they are and how much of a part of the mitochondria they are, or are they really somewhere in between the two, or you know, there's, they're juxtaposed, sandwiched somewhere between the two. So, um, you know, one, one thing that I'm going to mention before I forget, because when I, when I read this paper, and there's a lot to cover, and we're probably not going to get through most of it, because it's probably going to be me covering a lot of <laughs> the figures. Um, there's a lot of, in, inside of a cell, there's a lot of vesicle transport. There's a lot of a lot of things moving back and forth. So these aren't cross sections that's, that are static, right? There, you don't just have a mitochondria and a mam and 
It's, and it just lives like that floating around, right? Things, things move up and down, you know, laterally. By up and down, I mean they go from the ER to the Golgi, from the Golgi to the plasma membrane, you know. Um, vesicles are, are being transported back and forth. So, so one thing that I, I'm not sure that the, and I read this paper and, and, and it was a while ago. So, I'm, you know, there's all, it's, it's a pretty big paper. So um, I can't remember most of it, but I think one, one thing that's still, um, one thing that I still think is, is missing, and I know I'm jumping to, to the discussion point and before I even get into the data, but the, addressing how, how these palmitylated um, APPs um, actually get to the plasma membrane because because the the authors do implicate that having them in these MAMs leads to eventual translocation to the membrane. Uh, okay, so you know what what um, what sort of transport mechanism is involved? So there's a lot of questions there. You know, as far as um, you know, what sort of uh, what sort of codimer proteins are involved? What sort of what sort of motor proteins are involved? How is this transport happening? Right, because these things are you know so. Uh, things these are things are working like a conveyor belt so so there are there are still gaps here we still have you know we we, we know that they're in these maps according to this paper and that we know that juxtaposition with these specialized membranes leads to more of the amyloid precursor protein um particularly the one that what's going to be cleaved um uh, you know and, and released as 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 amyloid beta we know that that's going to eventually end up in the plasma membrane but how exactly that's that's that goes from there to there? Um, I think that's probably going to be a future paper, unless unless the previous paper covered that. But I don't think so because this is this is a very new paper and this is a new mechanism that's being posited here. Okay. Um, let me open the paper here and share. All right. So, um, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling through here, if I could remember some of this. So, um, so we'll take a look at um, figure one here. Um, and uh, I had some notes written down, which I don't have in front of me here, but this figure here basically is, um, so these are fractions. So they do fractionation assays here uh, to basically see where they can isolate um, the palmitylated. So the whole thrust of this paper again is uh, implicating palmitylated amyloid precursor protein versus non-palmitylated, uh, you know, uh, amyloid precursor protein, um, and uh, and implicating the palmitylated variant with the one that's going to be processed, um, you know, processed later for uh, for amyloid beta secretion. Uh, so. In figure one, basically, um, they do uh, studies in differentiated human stem cell derived neural progenitors um, that are basically uh, uh, FAD background familial uh, Alzheimer's disease and in also mouse brain um, extracts, which is in figure sub figure one F. And what they're doing in these figures here um, is that they're looking at um, the fractions here are, like I said, you know, looking at rafts and non-rafts, and rafts are basically those lipid rafts. Um, and I believe uh, so. There's two. Gosh, I wrote it down. Uh, I have to take a look at my my notes here. Uh, so let's see. Um, one of the rafts is uh, there's a marker flotillin, and IP3 R3 is a marker. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. Hold on a second. Let me get my let me get my note here. It's just uh, Steve. If you remember which oh flotillin the RAF so a RAF marker flotillin MAM marker. Okay, so flotillin is a general RAF, RAF marker, and uh, the MAM marker is the IP three R uh, three protein. Uh, so what they're basically showing, you know, and this is. Um, uh, this bar graph here is basically a quantification of figure uh, 1A and other figures. But basically um, what uh, this data is showing here is that you have a, a preferential enrichment um, in these um, rafts that are associated with MAMS. Um, so this is done through, you know, through I think um, density centrifugation. 
Um, so you have a, a, a concentration of the palmitylated um, APP um, component in, this, in these rafts that are, that are labeled with, I, that basically have um, a, uh, a marker, protein marker, IP3R3. Um, and that's where you get an enrichment for these palmitylated, um, these palmitylated APPs. So um, I'm going to stop sharing here temporarily if anybody has any questions. Is there any, any particular part of the figure that anybody is interested in digging into a little bit thoroughly, more thoroughly? Well, you know you like being thorough. Yeah, I'm not, not going to be. We're not going to have time to go through figures one through seven, especially if there's a lot of the figures have A, B, C, D, E, F. <laughs> so we're going to have to pick. We're going to have to pick and choose the sub figures that we all like. Well, you'll have to go for the uh, the juicy details. I mean, you know. Okay. What, what, what particularly uh, excited you uh, um, out of one to seven, Oliver? Let's say um, if you had to pick three. Well, uh, you know. Like like all like most biology papers, the exciting stuff happens at the at the back of the paper, right? I mean that's uh, uh, you basically you basically you basically lead up to the so other than other than the um, other than the um, um, abstract, right? Scientific papers when it comes to figures, uh, the lead is typically buried, right? It's usually somewhere in the middle or all the way at the end, right? And I think figure the last figure and probably the second last figure are the ones that you know where the authors actually, um, you know, actually show um, where 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 this is where this is all kind of kind of happening. It's always, um, it's always, it's always with papers. It's always business at the front and party around the back. It's a bit like a mullet. Yes. So. We might actually do the, you know, this is this is an experiment. Let's see if we can do this figure backwards. I mean, the paper backwards, right? Is this right. a bit like where you play records in reverse to see if there's any hidden meaning? Because I've done this a few times now, gone back to front with papers. Uh, yeah, I have. Um, but this is uh, okay. So, um, so this is a small figure right here, but this is staining. So, um, what they're looking at here is they have. Uh, so they have these human um, neural progenitor cells, these FAD, um, and they have these uh, 3D cell cultures. Um, and they have this really, they have this interesting assay where they have this microfluidic device where they can actually, um, actually have a picture of it here. So here I go backwards now again, this E, figure E, which all these axonal projection, uh, axonal, I guess this is an actual image. Um, and it's stained with GFP. These axons are actually going through some channels, so they're able to basically, they're basically able to isolate. Well, not isolate; they're still connected. But the axons are in one chamber, and the body's in another chamber. And you can then draw off liquids from these chambers, and then test for secreted um, amyloid beta protein, right? And then basically see see the protein that's being basically um, secreted out. Um, which is actually happening primarily from axons. So that's that's one thing to keep in mind is, is cells are not all uniform. Um, they are radically different in, uh, uh, you know, in shape and also different things are happening in different areas of, 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 of the cell, right? So the axons look distinctly different morphologically, but also different processing events are happening in those areas. And that's sort of where we're, we're getting a lot of this a lot of the secretion happening. Um, uh, so <clears throat> this, uh, so this S1R receptor tends to tends to associate with, and I don't think they go into at least that much detail um, of this S1R receptor. It's associated with MAMS, my, uh, the the mitochondrial associated ER uh, membrane proteins, um, uh, the membranes. And um, it tends to basically, you know, having more of this S1R um, uh, receptor, and I'm not exactly 100% sure of the mechanism, tends to lead to more, um, more MAMs forming and more of these lipid rafts forming and more of these palmitylated APP proteins forming. And they used in this paper um, several drugs that are basically, one is an um, agonist of uh, SR1, uh, I forgot the name of it, 
so, uh, it's uh, abbreviated here pre and the other one NE. So what is it? Uh, pre PRE084, which is an agonist of, of SR1 and uh, NE100, which is an antagonist. Um, and I believe they have a, uh, a base inhibitor, uh, which is the beta secretase inhibitor, which also should basically generally lead to a decrease. So that's kind of their positive control, the decrease of amyloid beta. So what they show in this kind of last one here is that, you know, activation of this receptor SR1, and they show earlier, so we're going to go backwards, um, activation of SR, S1R basically leads to more MAM formation. Um, but here they, and, and here they're showing that if they um, um, activate it, um, they have higher levels, uh, you basically have greater, you know, AB molecules per cell body over axons, so are greater, you know, in the axonal um, area um, if you treat it with an agonist of SR, S1R um, versus if you treat it with an antagonist, you then have the opposite effect. You have less um, amyloid beta molecules, right? Um, and earlier in the paper, they show that S1R correlates with an increase in MAM formation. And I'm not 100% sure how this, so this is a receptor that's uh, associated with these lipid rafts with MAMs. And I'm not sure how it leads to, again, that's another question, how it leads to more of these, um, more of these MAM, um, I guess I can call them vesicle-like structures, um, mitochondrial associated ER, um, you know, ER membranes, um, because I keep talking about them, Since I control the paper, I can just go through, go from one figure to another. Let's just go to figure two. And um, if you want to actually see what a MAM looks like, um, well, today is your lucky day. Uh, this is a cross section in figure two of transmission electron mic micrograph of, um, I'm not really actually sure if you actually can see the MAM here. Um, there's M is the mitochondria, ER is, well, the ER, and then the mitochondria are smack dab ju juxtaposed right against the ER here. Um, so something's happening between the ER and, and the, and, and the, you know, and the mitochondria here, right? And, um, what you're looking at in this figure, SI non and SI S1R, that's that receptor again. So if you, if you basically, uh, so this is, um, this is an interfering RNA. So this is a knockdown of the receptor. So if you knock down the receptor, you basically, um, and they quantify this and, and that's the bar graph. MAMS per mito, right? So um, knockdown of S1R, you have less. So, so it's almost like the mitochondria, you know, I'll be poetic here, are kissing the endoplasmic reticulum, right? They're giving it a smooch. Um, and I'm not really sure exactly, you know, if this is, um, you know, how this how this is actually bridged, right? So this is, you know, we have the proteins. Proteins tend to, you know, there's there's proteins that hold membranes together. That's how all of our cells are held together with 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 all sorts of um, intermediate filaments and whatnot. I'm not saying that that's what's happening here, but there's there's some connection here between between the ER um, and the MAMs. Uh, or ER and the, and the and mitochondria, excuse me, and, and you have this formation of a MAM. And, and again, I, I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure if, if when you isolate these MAMs, whether you are isolating a patch region of these, of these uh, membranes that are basically connected, or there's, uh, you know, according to their illustration, there's an actual squished vesicle there, right? That's, that's sort of, that's sort of um, you know, so is it, a, is, is it a vesicle or is it, or is it two membranes that are, that are still somewhat semi-independent, right? Um, anyway, does anybody have any thoughts, comments on this? We're getting on a, on a real subcellular deep dive here. I remember first right. hearing, yeah. I'm surprised it's not linked to the uh, Golgi anyway, because the ER goes to the Golgi uh, package uh, vesicles. Um, so um, yeah, what's that all about? I mean, so this MAMS is an intermediary thing between the two. I mean, surely it gets finally packaged and transported from the Golgi, right? Um, which essentially is, I, I like to think of it as the, the, the post office or the postal depot of 
of the cell because it literally sorts and sends most vesicles, isn't it? So I would be very surprised if, if, if it didn't have a role to play here, although it, it might not, but I definitely think it would because it's a transportation mm -hmm. uh, center really, isn't it? And it, and it, and it labels uh, these packages of proteins or vesicles, it, it labels them either for internal delivery external delivery obviously it also plays a role in the formation of lysosomes mm. and, and other things as well so i'd be mortified if mams isn't part of that and is a, an additional sort of intermediary step which is interesting i think it's quite interesting because i wrote recently about the golgi and uh, i went all i went all into that and explored it so i found that quite interesting but it, it, it it's surprising how sophisticated the cell is um and, you know, just how many little factories and depots and things an individual cell has, it's amazing. Well, I think it is anyway. Well, that's, 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 actually, that's actually very insightful, Steve, that you mentioned that because um, I was thinking about how you're phrasing it. And it's, and it's true, of course, the, the, the Golgi is a major pathway for the secretory um, pathway, right? So that's how vesicles go from, you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of the canonical traditional way. Things go from the ER, uh, they go to the cis Golgi and then, then the trans Golgi and then that and then the vesicles, you know, one vesicles are basically blebbing out from one 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 area to another being transported along, you know, microtubules and then boop, go out to the plasma membrane and either proteins end up on the surface or they get secreted out. Um, and this and this uh, this MAMS here, these MAMS with that are found juxtaposed on the ER. Um, maybe this was mentioned in an earlier paper because I this Bhattacharya, you know, has done work in this in the past, and I haven't really <laughs> I haven't I've dived into the the wonderful world of mitochondrial associated uh, ER membrane proteins. So um, this might have been covered in earlier papers, but uh, it it's it's this you know, and if it has, um, great. If it hasn't, then then you know this is something that you mentioned here, Steve, that uh, got me thinking, you know, this could be a way for, um, you know, again, mitochondria associated with this, you have these palmitylated um, amyloid precursor proteins. Um, are they normally, I'm not sure, are they normally found in mitochondria? Why are mitochondria involved here? And is, is, this, is this a way, is this a conduit to somehow, you know, get rid of these APP, I don't want to say get rid of because APP has all sorts of positive functional roles, but is this kind of a pathway from mitochondria, which then delivers these APPs that are palmitylated through these MAM, transient MAM structures, and then that goes from the ER, like you said, Steve, to the Golgi, and then out, right? So this is a, this is a conduit, right, from uh, amyloid precursor protein palmitylated, concentrated on these MAMs, you know, this kiss happens, which is basically like a delivery to the ER, right? Just transient delivery. And then, and then it goes off to um, those, you know, off out there, right? So, and this S1R receptor might be involved in this, in this vesicular transport pathway, this packaging to, to, the, to the surface. Um, again, just tossing that out there, but, you know, that was, yeah, my, I think that was a very good, good insight there, Steve. Yeah, Stefano. Anybody, we have a small group, so feel free to jump in. <laughs> okay, now, hey, I, I'm, I'm a newbie, so I don't know how this normally works, but, but no, I, I, I think the, the comment by Steve uh, and, and your follow-up were, were very interesting, and, and, and it speak to something that I was uh, uh, wondering, that is, uh, I mean, I know they haven't checked, but I'm wondering, the, this, of course, uh, as you've been saying, seems like an important mechanism for uh, protein trafficking, and it's one of, like, it probably connected to this uh, mainstream way of moving proteins around. And I, I was curious if, if they could see any difference in any other protein uh, trafficking or uh, protein uh, secretion where, when they blocked uh, all this, because I, I would guess that uh, APP is not the only protein that, that, uh, that is uh, riding this, this, uh, this pathway. Yeah, there's some other proteins that were associated with it, and I'm not sure if they're just kind of looking at it as markers. So um, let me kind of share the screen and go back to the paper. So here's, you know, here's that tantalizing TEM image of ER and mitochondria kissing. So, so you know, 
Um, so again, I'm not 100% sure if this, this is something shedding from mitochondria and then connecting with ER, if that's like an actual vesicle transport in of itself there, or it's, it's some sort of, some sort of, you know, I'm not sure how, you know, if there's some sort of outer leaflet to outer leaflet, you know, the plasma membrane, I mean, not plasma membrane, you know, um, uh, membrane, right. Uh, you know, by bi lipid bilayer, um, transport taking place here. Like, I don't, I'm not really, I'm not really sure, you know, so there's a lot of mechanisms to kind of unpack here. Like what the heck is actually happening right there, right. At that juxtaposition. And then how is that trafficking happening exactly to the surface? Right. So, so it's a lot of, a lot of really, um, kind of tantalizing stuff. And um, so this IP3R3 um, is associated with these MAMs. Um, and uh, there's the other protein ACAT um, that's associated with processing mm -hmm. of APP. I can't remember off the top of my head, the, the acronyms, um, what these proteins are doing, but um, they're probably going along for the ride, I'm assuming. Um, I'm not sure if they actually look to see if those specifically are um, at the plasma membrane event essentially, eventually, but um, uh, again, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot more other proteins that are there as well. It's probably not, not the only ones. Um, so let me see. So figure one, you know, they, they enrich, um, there's a lot to kind of look in here, but uh, again, MAMs tend to enrich in these proteins. So the S1R uh, receptor, um, uh, this IP3R3, which is, um, it's a MAM, it's called a MAM marker, IP3R3, but um, I'm not sure exactly. Um, somebody wants to do so, like a Google Foo search right now and <laughs> pull up IP3. So see, what's it here? Um, S1R is a chaperone protein residing in MAMS, interacts proteins with IP3R3, which anchors the outer mitochondrial membrane protein voltage dependent anion channel. There we go. Isoform 1, VDAC1 to the ER associated molecular chaperone glucose regulated protein. So, so there's like this protein protein bridge connection here. Um, so it's, it's sounding like these MAMs are like a protein, protein kind of bridge, right? And, um, uh, but of course that still kind of leads to the question of how, how things are moving, right? From, if, if it's going through the Golgi, then how, how is it going from, from there to there to there, right? So how, how is that, you know, how is that transport happening? Um, uh, which, is, which is a good question. Um, you know, maybe, you know, there, there might be, there might be some APP, palmitylated APP transporter that is yet unidentified. I'll toss that out there, right? I don't know. Um, so let's take a look here. Um, so here is where they, in figure two, they implicate the silencing or inactivation of MAM resident. Um, so we got more of a name here, which... <laughs> doesn't really explain much of its function. Sigma-1 receptor, S1R, right? Um, so silencing and inactivation in these um, FAD, um, these uh, neuronal, progenitor, uh, neuronal progenitor cells decreases, um, decreases MAM levels and reduces palmitylated APP level and subsequent um, secreted APP beta release. So, so this... Um, S1R receptor, which I jumped over to figure seven to show that if you basically antagonize it or agonize it using drugs, various two, two different drugs, um, you basically are, um, uh, you basically, you know, have, have more of um, more amyloid beta being secreted as a result. Um, so, uh, so in this figure here, this is where I mentioned earlier that they're using this um, interfering RNA to knock down um, S1R. Um, and you basically have a, a loss of these connections, these MAMs, um, and as a result, uh, yeah, and as a result, you basically have, um, have less of them uh, forming. So, um, okay. So are there any, any other questions here so far as we go through some of the other figures? Only what I put in the uh, comment. Oh, what was the, sorry, I didn't. Uh, this also speaks somewhat to the potential role of autophagy in aging as increased autophagy should in theory reduce MAMS. Yeah. Um, yes. So uh, 
that's yeah. So I, I is so generating many ideas here, Steve. So for follow up experiments, right? So if we if we if we turn up autophagy or we 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 turn it down, right? Is this going to actually have an effect on on these mams, right? Or is and as a result, um, uh, the secretion of amyloid beta, right? Um, yeah, and there's, there's there's some tantalizing suggestions out there that dietary interventions can sometimes have an impact. So, and we know autophagy is one of the potential ways of extending lifespan, caloric restriction, and uh, and other things like time restriction feeding hit those pathways for autophagy. Uh, what else does rapamycin, uh, Oliver? Mm -hmm. Definitely a potent uh, trigger of uh, uh, autophagy. And, you know, I think it's, I think all these different things are probably going to become a lot more apparent in the near future. So, uh, yeah, um, better autophagy, because as you know, it, it does decline as you get older. So is Alzheimer's in part the overproduction of these MAMs, uh, which then leads to aggregates? Should uh, autophagy and other things be actively slowing that down? And that is the one of the mechanisms by which it works. Obviously, we know the mTOR pathway as well is part of that. But it, I just find it intriguing um, that a dietary approach Restoring uh, the metabolism or the homeostasis of the metabolism could be a viable approach to healthier longevity, should we say? Not necessarily increase lifespan in humans, but I would say health span almost is most likely. Any thoughts on that? I mean, you know, autophagy, caloric restriction, and other ways of triggering it, could it be influencing the man? Um. Let me Google that for you. I, I don't know. I'm, I mean, um, I, 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 I would say that, you know, look, how it works is autophagy is a, is a survival response, okay, to, to stresses like famine, and situations of nutrient uh, scarcity. So the first thing the cell does is open that, enter that mode, and it goes for austerity measures. So it switches up the emphasis on growth, and, and it goes pro-survival. It puts the shields up like Captain Kirk style. You know, if for you Star Trek fans out there, sorry about that. I couldn't resist, but that's what the cell does. And autophagy is one of those austerity measures where it starts to break down um, cellular components that are not deep needed. That could also include misfolded proteins and things like MAMs. They probably serve a purpose, but when produced in excess, they produce ag uh, aggregates, right? So encouraging your cells to enter this survival mode with where autophagy and other austerity measures are triggered could be a potential way of actually mitigating or reducing or at least slowing down Alzheimer's. Just put yeah. that out there. Yeah, and, and, and just kind of as a corollary to what you just mentioned here, um, again, there's a... Um, they may have mentioned this in the paper, but I'm not 100%. I don't think so. Um, and this is probably a little bit more focused question here is, OK, um, you've got these MAMs forming, and you've got, as a result, more, more uh, palmitylated um, amyloid precursor protein getting to the plasma membrane and cleavage happening of, of, a, of you know, of, uh, to release amyloid beta. Um, and you now have a way we can, we can potentially decrease these MAMs. Um, why is, why is the cell doing this? Is this, is this, um, is this affect the viability of the cell, right? So if we, if we say, okay, no more MAMs for you, does the cell like that? Is it die? Is it, is it, is it, uh, is, is it like, is, is too much palmitylated, you know, uh, is this a mechanism to get rid of too much palmitylated, uh, you know, is palmitylation of this amyloid precursor protein, um, is, you know, is, is it a way for it to get something toxic out of one, one mechanism and, and it's fine out there for a while, but it's worse inside the cell. So if you block this pathway, it's even worse, right? So, so the talk in this, you know, obviously the, you know, the, the scope of this paper is obviously, you know, the final scope is we want a, a therapeutic remediation of Alzheimer's disease, 
And if we're going to be throwing drugs at this pathway to say, okay, let's dampen it. We, we, we got, we got to, we, we got to stop it because we don't want to have any more amyloid beta forming. So let's, let's dampen it. Um, what's, what, what, what happens to the neurons, right? Is this, is this good for the neurons? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, you know, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure. And so I, I, it'll be interesting to see like viability assays to see if, and maybe they did that in the prior paper. They, they showed that, okay, you, you know, I've, obviously if you do dampen these, this pathway and it should, and it leads to neuronal death, then that's kind of bad, right? That you don't, you know, you, so, so, so I, I have a, I have a question there. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of really cool questions like that you mentioned that you brought up Steve and a lot of directions for, you know, for, for, what exactly taking place here. And um, this is a really cool paper because it's really getting, this is a real like cellular slash molecular biology paper where it's getting into the mechanistic details of what the heck is happening with the transport of these, of these factors, which you need to get into that level of detail if you want to design you know, a, a drug therapeutic that, that can target this. Um, and I'm not going to get into the, into the weeds of whether amyloid beta amyloid beta proteins in, you know, are, are, are the major driver of Alzheimer's. There's, there's plenty of review papers out there that are like, maybe not. Right. So let's, let's ignore that. <laughs> that but uh, I've even, I've even seen some research that suggests that the, the, these amyloids actually have a protective quality to them yeah, initially, yeah. but then when they get in, uh, when they, when, when they uh, sort of become excessive, they become a problem. Well, it's, it's like everything, isn't it? Metabolism requires balance. And I'm going to say that the mammals is interesting, but what I would, I would also want to sort of go further upstream and say, well, what, where, where is this mam stuff coming from? I'm going to say, look, guys, it's the mitochondria again, isn't sure. it? It's so the mitochondria. Stefano, thanks for thanks for joining us, and um, and and I know you got to jump off to your. So Stefano is joining us from Beta Dow, and um, uh, maybe I can join your journal club at some point too, and and hope you had hope you had a enlightening, fun, <laughs> fun brief time here <laughs> joining us from this it, paper. It was really nice to learn about about MAMS, and sadly I I had only time to to skim through the paper, but, but I cannot wait to be here next time and, and actually uh, participate a little bit more. So, and you of course, uh, very welcome to, to come to, to our journal club. Yep. Awesome. Thank you guys. All right, take care. So we're, we're back where it all started um, really, aren't we Oliver? On um, getting us back to the mitochondria, which is one of, actually two of the proposed hallmarks of aging include mitochondria, I'm going to talk about the PCG one A access of aging again. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, you, you, uh, again, uh, there's so many things that could be, that could be, so many questions I have that, you know, I guess that's, I guess it's a sign of a good paper, right? It's like, it's like uh, another question, another question, number one with mitochondria, right? If we perturb mitochondrial function in some way, do MAMs go up, right? If we, if we, if we, if we just, if we, if we, um, lead to more you know, free radical production, do more, do, do MAMs go up, right? Like, like, what if, like, what, if, what is, you know, what, what are all the drivers of these mitochondrial associated ER? One, um, thing is, membranes? one thing is pretty obvious here, and I would definitely think it would be useful, is to actually look at MAMs production in different age groups. So look at someone who's in their 20s, their mid 20s. What is the MAM, what is the level of MAMs production? Look at somebody who's been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's because it's getting um, it's getting people uh, affecting people who are younger and younger. I've heard of people in their late like late twenties, early thirties. Look at the man's production in those people, and then look at somebody who's not got that diagnosis, and again compare it. And if it shows an increasing level of man's, which it almost certainly does. Um, I'm going to just point my fingers straight at the mitochondria and go, you guys, you guys, that's you guys. So, and again, it, it, it sort of confirms the strategy of boosting mitochondrial function or correcting mitochondrial function or replacing mitochondria that are damaged is a viable uh, route, Oliver. Uh, could mitochondrial therapies, which we know address uh, mitochondrial myopathy in humans, could that also address Alzheimer's? 
you know, some of the things that Amutha uh, at the SENS Research Foundation are doing, could that be indirectly but relevant to Alzheimer's via this mechanism of uh, MAMS? Yeah. I'm just putting it out there. Great questions. And if Bhattacharya and colleagues aren't working on this already, then maybe they should be taking notes. <laughs> um, to, um, I think we should speak to the movement. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of cool, cool things that could, could be, could be spun out of this. Um, okay. So let's see, back to the paper. So um, the still figure three, four, five, and six. Um, uh, this figure here, um, you know, wasn't clear about some of the aspects of this figure here, but basically what they do is they do two things. They, they want to check for palmitylation of APP. So they have these palmitylation assays, which I believe, I'm not too familiar with them, but basically palmitylation is, is like I mentioned before, if this, this, um, uh, this fatty tail that gets attached to cysteines. And I think you can transfer that tail to another substrate. Um, it's like a, it's a thioester bond, and then you can you can detect the level of palmitylation. Um, and there's a there's there's a so they they use this um, ABE or Badrilla assay, which is I believe a company that does these assays. Um, and uh, implicated in this palmitylation is um, is um, I believe. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's, well, it's, it's definitely, well, it's enzymatically, <laughs> enzymatically um, performed. Um, and one way that you can block this is by using a cyclohexamide, which is something that inhibits protein synthesis. It's a chemical um, that's been isolated, I believe, from microbes. And I believe it, it specifically targets the elongation step of ribosomes. Um, so if you block uh, if you block this, then I'm just kind of going down to, so this chase is with the cyclohexamide. So this is a kind of a little bit of a complex assay. So if you block, if you block essentially, um, if you block uh, protein synthesis, um, you know, you, you basically will, will decrease palmitylation over time. And this is just uh, the control vehicle. And these are, these are just figures from, from the palmitylation assay and the lysates. And this is quantification down here. Uh, in D and E, but if you, um, but you can, you can, but specifically implicated in this, and I'm not exactly sure how this receptor actually is involved with, with the, with the direct palmitylation, um, uh, you know, how it, how it exactly, I guess, interacts with the enzymatic step of palmitylation of APP. I'll just be blunt here. But you can rescue this effect by adding in the, the chemical compound I mentioned, this pre-084, which is an agonist of, uh, of, of the uh, S1R receptor, or you can you know, further dampen it by adding in this, um, uh, this um, NE100, which is an antagonist. Um, and I'm, I'm still not 100% sure, um, probably like not even 10% sure exactly how the S1R receptor is, is, is mediating that. So um, they do mention in the, you know, so it is involved in uh, targeting, it's involved in the MAM formation, this S1R receptor. So that seems to be pretty, pretty important. And it's involved in, you know, um, also the, the palmitylation of APP, but I'm not exactly sure. So if we go to the receptor itself, uh, where was that where I basically, I just talked about it a little while ago, darn, I can't even remember it now. Um, somewhere I had it highlighted. Uh, somebody remembers what I, what I mentioned when I talked about that receptor, the Sigma, Sigma 1R receptor. Um, the chaperone. The chaperone, yes, chaperone. So, um, so I'm not exactly certain how it's, you know, what its role in, in the palmitylation, um, you know, how it's basically, how it's basically mediating that. Um, if somebody else has, if somebody's an expert on this receptor, um, I'm, I'm basically, uh, basically all, all ears on this. Okay. A specialist subject really, Oliver, that to be a specialist in the single receptor. 
yes. I yes. mean, there's, there's, there's specialization and then there's, there's specialization. I don't think anybody's that specialized. Yeah. Well, maybe, so. maybe there's the odd one or two people, but that is a really niche topic. Yeah, we should get we should get Bhattacharya. Uh, if I'm, I'm sure there's there's uh, you know um, I think we'll we'll I think we'll eventually come around to to to, to, to this topic again, um, especially since you know Alzheimer's is is a huge huge field. And if if this you know if all the work here if uh, this pathway is 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 correct in in being a major pathway for amyloid beta secretion, then. Um, then, uh, then yeah, um, I'm sure we're going to see a lot of follow-up papers, and love to have Bhattacharya and other colleagues on to basically go into some of the nuances here as to how they think this mechanism is working. Definitely, but I, I honestly think we, we do need to look at um, age group um, specific uh, mammoth production and see, you know, if it's produced in the same quality uh, quantity and it doesn't change from someone who's twenty to someone who's sixty or seventy then we're going to need to rethink that. But if it does escalate, then it's probably due to the failing mitochondria because we know that they get increasingly dysfunctional. It's got to be the, 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 the root of it is the failing mitochondria, almost certainly. Well, that, that, that's where the smart money is. Um, so, you know, do we go after the intermediary signals or do we go after the root of the problem? I know it. I, I, can, I can almost hear reason right now. <laughs> writing on the uh, fight aging and i can almost imagine you would be saying right now but all this is very fascinating but it's tinkering with metabolism and we should fix the root problem but he's probably not wrong oliver um why why target a specific niche mechanism a pathway which is very interesting when we actually could fix the mitochondria themselves i'm a bit like a broken record really but uh, I'm, I'm i'm gonna i'm gonna say that i think fixing the mitochondria would, would, would uh, resolve that. Yeah. Just my two cents. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that is certainly one of the major hallmarks that, that, uh, that is, that is being targeted. Uh, so, uh, so on to figure four. So I mentioned that amyloid beta you know, is secreted. And, and uh, so this palmitylated APP has to make its way to the membrane. Uh, so this is sort of, this is sort of where they, you know, again, there's gaps to be filled here. Um, uh, using these, these, uh, in, these antagonists and agonists of S1R. Um, so this is a, this, uh, this is an assay, this uh, palmitylation assay of biotinylated cell surface proteins. So um, basically they're purifying proteins and particularly palmitylated um, APP on the self surface. And what they're showing here, and this is a quantification of the plot that's on, on, um, on the left, uh, is when you, when you basically uh, treat these cells with this pre-084, um, which is an agonist of the S1R receptor, um, or you basically, um, or the opposite, this any 100 if you treat it with pre-084, which is an agonist of that receptor, which they showed earlier, leads to greater, I guess, um, production of MAMs. And um, I'll just say, I'll just leave that, the, I'll just say that the production of MAMs is just correlating with juxtaposition of ER and um, mitochondrial membranes. Uh, you get you get more of this. Um, you get more. Uh, you know. You get more palmitylated APP um, on the cell surface, right? So so not only do you have, not only do you have more palmitylated APP as we showed earlier, um, enriching in these MAMs um, as a result, but you also get more of it now, kind of you know, floating somehow, getting getting to the surface of the cells. Um, And what do they look at here? Um, so in Figure Five, <clears throat> they 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 basically do knockdowns of S1R again. This um, this the chaperone protein that's um, associated with with MAMs and, and leads to their uh, leads to their stability and leads to the pr uh, production of APP. Um, so silencing of S1R, and I think they're using the yeah they're using a, a interfering RNA in this case, not a drug. 
Um, that also regulates beta secretase cleavage of APP and PAL APP, which um, I believe uh, makes sense because this beta secretase cleavage happens more preferentially, um, I believe, in these MAMs. And this beta secretase cleavage is a precursor to the later gamma secretase cleavage, which leads to the production of. of um, so let me just stop sharing here and open up my PowerPoint presentation. Just as a reminder, whoops. Um, yeah, so base is uh, beta secretase. So right here, um, so once you have more beta secretase activity happening, uh, that is a precursor step for the next enzyme, which is gamma secretase to basically then release this amyloid beta, which is sandwiched between these two um, don't recall if that's the N-terminus or the C-terminus, but basically the middle, the middle domains of the protein, which then leads to uh, amyloid beta aggregation once it's released and solubilized, right? And this is happening in lipid rafts. So, um, so if you have more S1R activation, things are going more in this direction. And as they're going more in this direction, you are basically getting more beta secretase cleavage followed by more gamma secretase cleavage followed by amyloid beta aggregation. So I'm going to stop sharing here. So that's that's the correlation that they're making here in that figure. Um, so uh, so silencing of S1R modulation of activity regulates beta secretase cleavage. So of APP. So um, so again, if you if you if you knock it, you know, if you knock down S1R, you basically you know um, have less um, less palmitylated APP, but you also have less of this SAPP beta, which is the cleaved product of the palmitylated um, of the APP protein. So now we are in figure six. We did figure seven, we might revisit that again. Um, so here they look at, um, so again, S1R activity, um, should have done probably much more of a deep dive in S1R. It's certainly implicated with MAMS. Um, modulates MAMs in neuronal processes or axons without affecting MAMs in cell bodies or bulk neurons. So basically uh, what they're doing here, so this is a staining assay. Um, mito so I, we looked at a TEM transmission electron micrograph. Now they're doing staining with you know, fluorescent uh, microscopy here. So you have uh, the ER stained with GFP, mitochondria stained with RFP, and you know, these MAMs are basically uh, you know, the juxtaposition of, of the, of the, um, uh, of the endoplasmic reticulum membranes and the mitochondrial membrane proteins. Um, and this is treatment with that, um, <clears throat> agonist of S1R receptor, uh, well, call it a receptor, but chaperone protein. So it's, um, I believe embedded in the membrane, um, and the antagonist NE, and that basically correlates with, um, you know, uh, that correlates with having less, less MAMs present. Um, and the interesting thing is that this is actually correlating specifically with not MAMs in throughout the cell bodies, but so, um, uh, mitochondria are th throughout the, throughout the, you know, um, are found all over the neuron and they're actually transported all the way through these axonal processes. So this is that figure I showed earlier. They did this assay where they were isolating the secretion of amyloid beta, which happens primarily in axons. So the interesting thing here is that um, these MAMs uh, that are actually, you know, that are forming, um, that are, you know, forming as a result of this S1R uh, protein activity, um, they are, you know, they are primarily, um, you know, they are primarily af af being affected by these, you know, the antagonists and the agonists, these drugs um, within these processes, which are the axons and not necessarily in the cell bodies. So um, this is strongly, you know, strongly implicating MAMs in, in the secretion of this amyloid beta, you know, one, one more kind of evidence to this, because this is where most of the secretion is happening in, in, in axons versus the, the soma or the body of the cell. Um, and you're getting more of these MAMs are forming 
um, in the axonal processes versus the versus the the soma. So, um, so again, question here as to you know as to why this is happening, particularly through the axons, right? So, so I mean. It, I guess you know. I guess there's a lot of lot of cell biology questions here, right? Like we 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 tackled a couple of questions before as to uh, you know what's what's the implication of the Golgi? How is it actually? How are these how are these lipid rafts that are associated with MAMs that have more palmitylated APP, you know, getting to the cell surface? Um, and now you know the question I guess I have is now you know why was more of it necessarily happening in the axons versus the cell body, right? So you have mitochondria being transported along um, microtubules, right? So mitochondria are moving all over the place and they're going, they have to go throughout the cell to generate energy for ATP all over the place. So they're, they're moving along the axons and then these MAMs are preferentially forming in the axons and then the APP is being secreted out to, or to the plasma membrane and then getting cleaved by gamma secretase primarily in the axons, right? So that's kind of like the direction that this is, that this is seemingly going. Um, and um, I don't know, maybe somebody has some insight. Why doesn't it go the other way to dendrites, right? Or uh, is there, is there, is this arbitrary for the cell or is there, you know, is there, is there a, a biochemical reason Right for for this to be happening in 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 that direction, in the in the anterior grade direction, you know, towards the axons versus retrograde back towards back towards the the, the soma or the cell body. Sounds like more research is needed. Yeah, you say virtually every time. But yeah, but. Yeah, but this this one here, I don't know. I I I think I you know I think we, we generated a lot a lot more questions, right? A lot more follow up questions than most other papers that we've read. That is true. Um, hey John, John, like like your cat? I have a cat. I have two cats. Wasn't there a cat protein involved in this uh, paper? Pretty sure there's a cat protein. This is Princess Leia. Princess Leia. How old is Princess Leia? She's four. Oh, my cat. My cat is. My cats are just turned five, I believe. So they're about the same age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Male, boy, boy and girl, brother and sister. Nice. So of course, in neurons, normally when they secrete messengers, they secrete it through the axon. So maybe that is just a preferred neuronal direction. Yeah, um, it, that's uh, you, yeah. It could be it could be a default uh, mechanism. It's like um, you know you, the system is already in place to you know to, to transport things, package you know package neurotransmitters and vesicles and things going in, in that direction. So let's just hop on that highway and, and and move other things in that direction as well. So that's you know that's certainly uh, a hypothesis. <laughs> Well, it's a good hypothesis. I mean, it's it's. I mean, evolution evolution builds on previous things, right? And sort of uses 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 what's there, and 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 um, and then you know, and that might be that might be why the axons are the are the sort of the gateway out of the out of the neuron for all things, right? Um, uh, yeah. Here's another idea, another potential therapeutic route: uh, macrophages. You could engineer macrophages um, or tissue resident macrophages to uh, detect MAMs and bunch them. So uh, if they're not serving a useful purpose and they're just waste that's being ejected, if we can actually prove that, um, then that opens up the door for engineering uh, subsets of macrophages specifically to go after MAMs. So then you don't need a drug. You've got literally a living drug in your body that eats all the mams. Right, right, and 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 if and if amyloid beta is you know certainly has has antimicrobial properties, right? You can probably do assays where you where you where you basically stress the cells by adding in. Um, I, I'm just throwing things out there: lipopolysaccharide microbial peptides that basically trigger some response, and and you should see you should see more amyloid beta released, which 
probably people have already done a bunch of times, but you should see as a consequence more of these MAMs being produced, you know, to, you know, so, um, and it could be, you know, again, maybe, maybe this is also, um, maybe this is also a, a a conduit to get rid of misfolded proteins as well. I'm not sure, um, but certainly, but certainly in this paper here, they implicate MAMS and uh, and and their kind of role, their you know their key role or their their starting point for for you know for conveying palmitylated APP to the plasma membrane and 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 cleavage by gamma secretase and you know secretion as an am soluble amyloid beta protein. Um, that may or may not, you know, have have a major role in in Alzheimer's and triggering it, right? Um, uh, well, sounds like we need to generate MAMS knockout uh, mice to actually test that, and uh, also look at well MAMS levels and production in people, as I said, in different age groups. But it'd be interesting. Um, certainly, they're working on things like senescent cells. They're working on a vaccine for senescent cells, which is, you know, could it be also applied to these particular vesicles or, or proteins therein, could we actually have a, I suppose for the want of a better word, an Alzheimer's vaccine, although it's not a vaccine in a true sense, but it could spur the immune system to uh, munch and destroy it, break it down. Um, you know, if that is assuming that all MAMS is, is bad and it's just waste, it may also have some kind of initially protective effect, though. That needs to be um, ascertained because it, it could be that in small doses it's actually important. And if it works in isolation, John, John's already did that big map of the metabolism a few years ago, and nothing works in isolation, right, guys? Yeah. <clears throat> it's about time uh, to update it. Yeah, I'd be hard pushed to think of anything particularly a single molecule that is just useless, it doesn't do anything. There's lots of multiple role functions. It's all about context, NFKB, TGF beta. Oh yeah, well you can't knock it all out because it does other things, you know, and I think a lot of that may apply also to MAMS. MAMS yeah. may be performing something. You, you, we just don't know. Um, so I definitely think more data is needed. But it'd be great to find out that it's actually useless, like seven keto cholesterol, which is about one of the only things I can think of that serves no biological purpose. Maybe it could be um, a waste product like seven keto, in which case that that makes it simple because then you've got a target to utterly eradicate. But yeah, um, I mean, I mean, I mean, to, to put on my professor's cap, I, I tell students that like biological molecules love to have multiple roles and um, there's simplicity in that because you don't have to, your biological systems don't utilize, cells don't utilize the entire spectrum of every single organic molecule that your mind can possibly conceive of. But at the same time, you know, you've got these really cool dual functionalities, like, you know, I mean, really just going down to the most fundamental nuts and bolts of biology, which is ATP, right? Energy currency of the cell, adenosine triphosphate. Yet at the same time, it's the same ATP that's being utilized as an information storage molecule in, in RNA. And, and if you look in biochemistry, right, all the, all the building blocks of RNA are utilized as, as metabolic substrates to drive reactions. Um, you know, uh, uh, UTP, uracil triphosphate, right? Um, TTP, GTP, right? I mean, they're all, they're all <laughs> use both information and as a, as a, as a metabolic intermediary, which is like this, like, like molecules having two completely, you know, diametrical uses like energy, which is poof and information, which needs to be more stable. Right. And, and it's the same, it's the same molecule, which is like, you know, uh, it's telling you something, you know, evolutionarily, right? Some, I mean, something fundamentally important. So when you talk about MAMs, which are these complex lip, lipid raft containing vesicles with all sorts of stuff, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's probably 10 or more or 12 or 20 different usages for these, for these structures, you know, that, that, you know, and, and maybe for waste removal and maybe for signaling, maybe for, you know, antimicrobial purposes. I mean, just because there's so much other stuff there and, and, you know, and, and if you look at a simple molecule like ATP or, you know, one of these nucleotide triphosphates that have dual functionalities, you know, and, and, and completely wildly different directions, 
then then yeah, you know, biological systems love to love to utilize the same things for different different purposes. Um, uh, you know, which 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 simplifies the simplifies the catalog of things you have to that that that, that the system uses, but kind of complexifies you know what each individual thing is capable of, depending on on the context of where it is. So anyway. That is my rant. That's my lecture. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> I don't know, but there's also a lot of uh, redundancy built into our biology too, which is actually a good thing. Um, case in point, the immune system, there's a lot of redundancy built into that. And they found out that a lot of uh, immune cells have a lot of overlap. They're like, huh, I didn't know. They, they were like, last year they were saying, oh, we didn't know that those people the cells did that job as well when T cells are not available. Well, yeah. So that's probably good as well that we've we've evolved with a lot of redundancy. But yeah, definitely more research needed. We need to understand what these vesicles, these MAMs are doing. Are they performing other important things? But I mean that would be quite apparent um if you make a knockout because if the mice if the if the knockout mice die then you'd be like huh it must be doing something else so i always remember what irena uh, convoy taught me which is everything exists for a reason and calibration rather than in inhibiting things is probably the best approach she was yeah. talking about tgf beta but you could apply that to everything you know you can't knock out tgf beta because it does lots of stuff NFK, uh, NFKB, ditto. They they all do things, and they can be pro aging or, you know, pro longevity, depending on context. And depending on the depending and the context is also dependent on time. I remember, I remember there was a huge uh, I don't want to say controversy, but you know, people were years ago, early in my grad school career, maybe before that as undergrad. You know, people were, were making these all these knockout mice and and suggesting a role for a protein because you knocked it out right in in the embryonic stage, and and you got some you got some function or you got no function and you said well it, it didn't play a role, um, but then you did a conditional knockout and you get a completely different you know effect when you knocked out the protein later in as an adult mouse versus if you knocked it out in an embryonic mouse because. Um, some other protein early on would take over the function of that protein, right? And then, and then, and then, and then, and then things would be okay. But if you did that later on, um, the system wasn't able to to adapt, right? So, and that then that completely complicated things, right? So then you're like, wait a minute, all these transgenic models of knockouts are like wrong. We got the wrong picture, you know. If we were we did it conditionally, like later, right? So, 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 you know time and, and position, right? That's, that's, uh, I guess that's, I guess that's the coordinates of life, right? Time and position, <laughs> coordinates of everything. So, so you have to, you have to make sure you're, you're looking at it at the, at the right moment in time as well. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of potential targets here. Palmitylation of APP being one of them, right? Can we just prevent the palmitylation and then prevent, prevent it from, accumulating because there's drugs that prevent that. Can we have a specific drug that prevents the palmitylation of, of APP and, and, and prevents it from going to the MAMS and prevents it going to, you know, then being um, cleaved by gamma secretase and having, you know, and, and what, what are the consequences of that, right? So, so, um, so again, uh, we'll leave that open for discussion for some other point, whether or not, you know, dampening down amyloid beta levels is generally good. Maybe it's good for some people. Maybe it's maybe again to further complicate things. Maybe a subset of people with Alzheimer's disease um, dampening down amyloid beta works, but maybe in some other people it doesn't. Maybe, maybe, maybe they have systems in place that they can tolerate very high levels of amyloid beta and and um, there's something else wrong that's going to cause dementia or maybe not cause dementia. And so so you know it might end up being, um, you know, Alzheimer's disease, like, like, like cancer, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of different ways the whole pathways can break down and just having one generic anti-cancer 
dampen all amyloid beta down, use chemotherapy to kill all replicating cells. It's just too much of a sledgehammer. That's not really, that's not really, um, you know, uh, effective for the, for the right, for the right target population. Um, I don't know. That's just, that's just a thought. That's why, um, that's why people are now advocating to go further upstream, forget trying to tinker with the metabolism is the phrase, but then I think that's a silly phrase because everything is metabolism, everything. So it's fairly meaningless. But the, the idea of going upstream, targeting what we believe to be those primary hallmarks of aging um, should fix a multitude of sins. We've already seen uh, evidence or tantalizing evidence of rolling back the epigenetic clock, uh, Acampo and Belmont, uh, Sinclair as well recently, restored site by rolling back that epigenetic clock, Oliver. So I honestly think that I'm not I'm not going to say that aging is sinful. It's it's certainly not, but I think there's some merit definitely of going upstream of these various branching and complex sort of nuances and targeting stuff at the top. Uh, Aubrey would, would would be giving me the thumbs up right now if he was here, but. I, I honestly think that's the way forward because you need to reduce that complexity as much as possible and target the core processes. So, but this is, you know, this is an interesting study and I still think the smoking gun is the mitochondria. I'm definitely thinking that. And, you know, if we fix those buggers, what happens, you know? I think there's probably four or five smoking guns. Oh, there's at least nine that I know, John, uh, nine hallmarks. <laughs> you know, it's like the Magnificent Seven or the Magnificent Nine, depending on what your point of view is. So, um, yeah, well, it's hopefully there's enough, if there's enough interaction, maybe knocking out three or four or controlling three or four will take care of all 10. It's possible. Um, I mean, hallmarks obviously is, a, is, 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 you know, not a perfect paper by any stretch. But it is a great foundation, as uh, Jao Pedro, uh, Pedro de Mangais, and I've butchered your name, sorry about that, Jao. Um, <laughs> he was saying uh, only last year that he still teaches his students that, you know, they, they begin with the hallmarks because it's an excellent foundation, but it is too simplistic. Uh, and, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm definitely in agreement there. I, I think he's uh, spot on. But it's great that, well, you well, know, The word hallmark itself could mean a cause, but it also could mean just an indicator that is a consequence. Yeah, and there's definitely a hierarchy, it seems. And Aubrey was saying a couple of years ago, he was surprised how much the, the how much interconnectivity between the different processes there are. I mean, for example, inflammaging or you know, just general in, chronic inflammation is seems to be like the thing that links everything together and there's a lot of crosstalk so potentially if you knock out say senescent cells if you work out which ones to, to get rid of that could alleviate other hallmarks as a consequence like stem cell exhaustion and blah 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 but you know i found it interesting that convoys no was it convoys no it wasn't convoys but somebody recently did a uh, neutral blood exchange paper and they showed that it sort of alleviated somewhat some of the like the the cognitive decline and that 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 makes for interesting uh, follow-up here i mean is uh neutral blood exchange a la convoys is that somehow reducing the um the amount of mams that are floating around in the milieu i mean all these things are you know i'm pretty sure that there's a study that showed that this neutral blood exchange also rectified or somewhat uh helped uh, mitochondrial function again it's it's interesting i just i just think you know fix the mitochondria and i think a lot of things well those are interesting questions because i've been uh, donating plasma on and off uh, for the second half of this year and uh, anything that we can measure in myself as an n of one i'm willing to be the guinea pig how easy is it to measure MAMS, Oliver? Um, well, um, you can certainly, well, I mean, um, 
it's not it's not easy. It's it's it certainly requires a lab, and certainly as you saw from this oops, saw from this paper, you got to do you got to do cell fractionations and uh, or or microscopy, right? So of, of one sort or the other to, to visualize these things. So either either you do some ultra high speed centrifugation in in various density gradients to get different membrane fractions, right? Or 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 you or you have to you know, because you're talking about a transient subcellular <laughs> localized, you know, lipid raft, um, you know, uh, quasi vesicular structure. I don't know. Um, so, so yeah, not 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 a not something that you can, you know. I don't think there's there's no there's like a, a rapid way you could you can test that. It's it's uh, you know. If you have the lab to set that studies it, sure, it's something that people do, but it's, you know, it's a labor intensive, um, you know, molecular biology process to, to do this. So it's not something you can process. I don't think there's some automated MAMS detection assay that, that well, maybe, maybe there will be, I don't know. Well, maybe one of the companies that is looking at um, biomarkers of aging, um, Zymo, for example, or Clock Foundation, might add that to their repertoire. Yeah, so I mean, I could certainly see with the development of, of software that's, uh, you know, again, out of, my, out of my scope, but, you know, AI, uh, like if you, if, you, um, if you do, if you, if you have a whole bunch of cells, right, that are, that are you know, um, fixed in a certain way um, and stained, right, then, then you can have an automated process that can basically score um, so, 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 and I, I'm not sure, you know, cause they did, you know, they were able to, to see these structures using fluorescence microscopy. So that would be probably the most, most, um, automatable, um, way to do it. But I'm, but again, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, if, if, if these, if, if, if this, if this pathway and these structures prove to be really, really you know, important and viable, then, you know, that's going to be all the motivation for some company to automate this and, you know, and, and, and then you have a, have a screen where you can basically then run your samples. But right now, you know, it's, 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 I believe labor intensive just because it's not an, has, has not taken the leap from individual bench scientists doing this assay to, you know, to an automated large scale version, you know, it hasn't done that yet. Um, but you know, if uh, if more promising data comes out of this, you know, this pathway, then yeah, that's going to motiv motivate people, I think, to go in that direction. Certainly, and I'm just going to harp on about the Comboys again here because I'm their number one fan. Um, they also did an experiment very recently that showed neutral blood exchange, where they I think we did it in Journal Club actually, Oliver, where they compared it with a analytic, and it showed that there was a reduction of uh, SAS associated proteins, uh, from more so from the blood exchange, which would make sense if you're diluting the blood, but also um, neurogenesis. Uh, blah, 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 I can't speak. Neurogenesis was uh, triggered in certainly in the hippocampus, uh, which is what they looked at. So that that again to me suggests. I honestly, I think we're going to get a lot of mileage out of neutral blood exchange, just removing the, the, the excess stuff that we don't need. It is perhaps a little bit crude, but I think it's probably a realistic near-term prospect. I'd be very interested to see if there's any data for people with Alzheimer's um, who perhaps donated blood or had, a, had some kind of blood exchange and see, see if there was any improvement. I'd, oh, I'd, 20 I'd, wise. Data. Tony Weiss Corre at uh, Stanford was uh, doing some experiments a couple of years ago on that, and be interested to see how that's progressed. Yeah, he was uh, he was working with Saul by Leader, if I recall, and I mean they all used and they to were they them. were giving them um, um, young people's plasma back, so it wasn't completely neutral exchange. Yeah, the Saul by Leader, and I think I think Tony uh, also uh, identified B2M. Uh, we've talked about uh, B2M before, Oliver, quite recently, um, and that seems to be a, a problematic factor in, in, in aged blood. But again, this all rolls back to when uh, Tony, uh, 
Saul Vi leader, um, Hanadi Yousef, who works on vesicles, by the way, from, uh, you, may, you may know the name Juvena. Um, she's actually working on uh, vesicle therapies, which is very exciting. Um, also, Irina and Michael Convoy and Amy Wagers. These are all the these are all what I call the blood people, which sounds a bit scary. <laughs> but all those guys uh, used to be, I think it was at Berkeley. They all used to be there at one point, but their labs are all next door to each other. So there's a lot of cross pollination going on, swapping of techniques and things like well, that. Well, Amy Amy Wagers came from Stanford across the bay. Yeah, I know they were. I know that they um. Some of, at least some of them all had like labs next door to them at some point. I don't know where this was. Might have been Berkeley, I'm not sure. Well, it was back, back Anadi, in the 90s. Anadi Youssef was um, half time in Irina Convoy's lab during her, um, her PhD work. And then she moved on over to Tom Rando at Stanford and then started her company. Okay. Some uh, heavyweights there, but. You know, they're, they're all linked um, together and it's quite an interesting it's quite an interesting story I read an article all about how they all knew each of the a few years ago and it's quite fascinating how they all sort of shared ideas and techniques and some of them have gone oh it's in the young blood some of them gone no yeah. it's what you take out it's important and um, I think it's maybe both but it's certainly demonstrable that you don't need young blood in order to spur rejuvenation. So for me, it's, it's, I think it's one of the more promising near future. Oh, I agree, because uh, you avoid a lot of problems by not taking in somebody else's blood. That's why I'm, I'm doing this experiment. I, I donate plasma, it, it helps people who need plasma. And so I don't have to set up a lab to do it. I just go up to the plasma donation center and they take out 690 mils and give me back my red and white cells. Yes, the albumin uh, seems to be playing a more important role than people suspected. It, it, it may be the case that aged albumin is more, mis I would say misfolded, but damaged, and it doesn't work as effectively as fresh albumin. So I think there's a lot of mileage in just neutral blood exchanging. Yeah, I agree. But what they've got to do is <laughs> they've got to find a, a more practical way of shoving uh, than shoving a giant needle uh, into your arm every every uh, month. That's not really practical. But they yeah. are experimenting uh, with that in Russia and um, uh, Dobby Kiprov and others and Irina. They are moving forward steadily towards you know getting this this sort of thing tested. I'm very excited about it. I'm not keen about the giant needle guys. Um, I think we're going to have to rethink how we're going to do that in the long term. Well, I've, I've gotten used to the needle. You just sit there with your arm on a, on a shelf while you can read a book or something. So, John, a quick question. When, when you do this procedure and they, 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 you said they put back your, because um, this is a, this is a uh, so you're donating. Uh, I'm donating plasma and plasma. receiving my red and red. white cells black, uh, back after they, um, uh, spin them down and do they do they do they do they then dilute that in in a in an isotonic solution like with oh alcohol? yeah yeah of course and they put they, that uh, it's a um, sterile saline so what is it 6.1 6.9 saline so the process is essentially like the like the heterochronic um it's it's, it's essentially the you know the plasma donation it's essentially i guess the the Rough well, it's getting or... getting rid of my old plasma, but not yeah. receiving any young plasma because my liver right. will make new plasma over right. the next few days. Right, right. So I can donate up to twice a, a week, six hundred and ninety mils of plasma. So by the end, you know, if I do that consistently twice a week for a whole month, I've gotten rid of almost all of my old plasma. So you, that's uh, are yeah. you supplementing it with iron at all, John? I'm, I'm sorry. Can you can you lift your microphone up, Steve? Yeah. Are you uh, are you supplementing with Iron um, or anything on top? Is Ion the name of a company? No. He said, yeah. uh, "Is are you supplementing with Iron?" Oh, yeah, Iron. 
No, no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, because I get my red blood cells back. I'm yes. not losing either my immunity or my iron. Um, there's an automated machine that takes out some of your blood, spins it down, mixes some salt water with the cells, and squirts the cells back in through the same needle. And it goes back and forth um, about 100 mils at a time over the course of an hour. How long have you, uh, how, many, how many times have you done this? Just curious. I started five years ago, but I haven't done it consistently. Um, I've done it twice this month. I did it twice in um, October. I did it three times in August. Um, and then before January, I had been doing it quite a bit. And uh, so I've gotten used to it. I'm, I'm reading David Sinclair's book now while I have my um, plasma taken out and my cells given back. Yeah, I've been, meaning, I've, been, I've been meaning to pick up David's book. How is it going so far? It's good. Um, the further you get into it, the more um, biology there is. The, the first chapter or two is his early life in Australia. Well, it's interesting. And he, he then can has something to touch back on when he, he talks about the biology he can draw analogies from his early life. So yeah, he's a good writer. He's got a, he's got a, I don't know if you'd call him a ghost author or a co-author and um, they've done a good job. We've got visions of David now dressed as Crocodile Dundee going, this isn't a pipette, this is a pipette. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, sorry then. There you go. My mum will probably sort of me now because she lives in Australia as well. So, oh dear, stereotypes, right? Yeah, not cool like that. Yeah, one other that's right. That's, that's right, mate. <laughs> yeah, because all Australians wear digger hats. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. I used to have one years ago a digger hat, John, where you could pin them up. You could pin the sides up. Right, you know, right, uh, yeah. They're pretty good, you know, because I used to go, um, I used to go um, like airsofting and shooting, and they were good because you need to pin the side of your, your hat up to, to bring your rifle up. Oh, right. And otherwise, it gets in the way of the scope. So that's why they have them. Yeah. Yeah, they're called, uh, I think they're, I'm pretty sure they call them digger hats or prospector hats, but they're quite unique. I don't, well, it's I don't to ever... keep, keep the sun off your face and not age your skin. Yeah, the corks are optional. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure I've never seen anybody wearing a hat with corks on it. Corks. I think that's a, I think that's a cliche. I, I, I question. Is that, is that supposed to is that supposed to keep like flies out of your face or something? I question the value of that. I honestly don't think flies would care. <laughs> but maybe, maybe. But I, I honestly think that's a cliche. <laughs> I just think it's stereotype. It's like all British people wear bowler hats. No. There you go. Oh, you guys, you don't call them bowler hats. You call them derbies, don't you? Uh, I know what a bowler hat is, so I, I think I've I think I've heard both. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think I think all of Western civilization wore a bowler hat in the early first first ten years, probably of the twentieth century. And that, that was it. It's probably a very well, very yeah, na they, very narrow period of time. Well, the re the reason why they have them is uh, they were essentially riding hats um, because. The top hat wasn't practical. Mm. The top hat was obviously the height of Victorian uh, fashion, but it wasn't practical really on a horse. So they that that's that's where the derby and the um, the bowler come from. Um, yeah, and, as and I remember, understand it. Yeah, and I read somewhere a lot of working class wore the bowler hats because the way they were it was fitted. There was it was like a, a bit of a space. So so it was actually like kind of the first uh, construction helmets, if you will, um, because it protected their noggin. And you see a lot of like. You know, when you see early pictures from, you know, the turn of the last century, you see a lot of the workers wearing those bowler hats, you know, shoved yeah. over their heads. Mm. Or the uh, flat caps, the newspaper boy hats, as people call them. But yeah, they're, uh, they're old. Proper old English style -y. There you go. Anyway. Yep. We've gone on a tangent there. <laughs> the hat wear and yeah. It's Oliver, a, uh, Oliver, yeah. I was wondering what city you're in. New York City. 
I'm in, I'm in a, specifically I'm in the borough of Queens right now. And are you working with the university? Uh, yeah, Cooper Union at the moment. Okay, cool. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's where I am. And yourself, John, where are you right now? I'm in North Florida, uh, Gainesville. It's uh, University of Florida hometown. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, me and my girlfriend are going to be, um, I've, ne- I've been to Key West many, many years ago, but um, we're going to actually be in uh, Miami for, for about 10 days over the Christmas break. We're going to be in Miami and then um, we're going to be on a, on a sailboat off the coast of Fort Lauderdale. Oh, nice. Well, if you happen to be driving up to North Florida, you're welcome to drop in. But if you're just flying straight down, then you probably yeah. won't do that. Unfortunately, our, our, our schedule is going to be kind of tight and uh, we're just, um, we're, we're going to be visiting Jean's aunt down there. So it's, you know, yeah. um, and, uh, and uh, so, yeah, so it's sort of like, you know, we got our itinerary, everything's already kind of set and go to Miami, check it out, drive up to Fort Lauderdale and then head back north. You know, a face mask and snorkel. Um, maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe. I don't, I don't, I don't. I may have a snorkel. I, I think somewhere in my closet, I've got a snorkel and a face mask. Take it with you. You oh. might find it fun. Yeah, I, I did that. Expensive for COVID, though, uh, 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 Oliver. I don't think you necessarily need to wear that on the plane. Maybe they're just the mask, but the snorkel, I think, and the goggles. I think <laughs> no, on get... the sailboat. <laughs> oh, <laughs> God, why didn't you say so, John? I thought you meant have him sitting there wearing his goggles on the plane. I'm gonna go snor- yeah, I'm gonna go snorkeling with a hazmat suit on. Yeah. Ten, ten, ten books if you do it. Ten books. Huh? Well, well in, good, in, good yeah, chatting with you guys. Same here. I'm uh, I'm gonna read that paper now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Right. Okay, everybody. So, on that note. Happy see ya. Turkey week, everybody, and we'll happy, I guess happy. We'll see you. Yeah, and we got to pick a paper for next month. I think it might be a it might be a senescence paper, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Might uh, be. I, sent you, I sent you that pretty compelling one that senescent cells may not be um, the optimum strategy as a target, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. All right, so everybody. thanks everybody who's joined us today. Anyway, and we'll we'll catch you next time. And uh, yeah, enjoy your turkey. Yep. Happy Thanksgiving. Take care. And meet them as well. Bye-bye.